Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hi, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. Past guests include Dr. Jason Glaster, who I'd like to thank for giving me our next guest. This episode is brought to you by Arizona Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can connect better with their family and friends and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about helping people with hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, from his hearing loss, from radiation to his brain tumor, and then again when he passed away. I only care for ears. I'm the ear of ENT who has performed over 10,000 ear surgeries and cared for thousands of patients with hearing loss over the past 20 years. I'm the founder of Arizona Hearing Center. I'm the author of Listen Up. Go to listenuphearing.com to learn more about the book. Go to azhear.com and contact us with any questions or any concerns or anything you'd like to talk about. I'm very excited about today's guest. Today, we have Dr. Hannah Glick. She's an audiologist and a cognitive neuroscientist with professional experience extending across healthcare, academic, industry, government, and entrepreneurial settings. Dr. Glick brings a fresh perspective to the profession, to the profession of audiology. She completed her AUD and combined triple PhD, I can't wait to find out about that, at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Her research focuses on the effects of hearing loss and hearing treatment and rehabilitation on brain health, cognition, and overall well-being. Dr. Glick, thank you so much for coming on Listen Up. This is great. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Happy to be here. That's great. So tell me your story, like how, you, you know, you have a triple PhD, which I'll confess to you, I'm not sure I've heard of that, but I mean, I get the concept, but what are the three fields of your uh, PhD and how did you end up there from being a high school student, college student, or however you got that path? Yeah. So I actually started my freshman year of college thinking that I wanted to um, be a French teacher. I was studying languages, English and French, and I was sitting there in my first year classes and reading all these books. And I felt like I was being told what to think while I was reading. Um, I had to interpret things in a particular way. And I just didn't feel really challenged, but I loved languages. And I was also always interested in science and biology. So I ended up pivoting a bit, um, switched schools, switched majors. And I had a family friend that I grew up with whose mom had a cochlear implant. And I saw how much that impacted her and changed her life. And that's what kind of got got me interested in audiology. I'd never heard the word audiology before, but right. that's kind of what set me down that trajectory. So um, started um, out as an undergraduate student in speech, language, and hearing science at University of Colorado Boulder. And as I was taking classes, I loved what I was learning. But at the same time, I felt like we focus so much on the ear and we basically ignore the brain entirely. Yes. And really, we hear with our brain, not our ear. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that. I tell people this now, like in my exam rooms, I have this big diagram of the ear, right? And on the right-hand side, there's a little curve and it says brain. And I always yeah. tell people like, based on scale, that brain goes like up to the top floor and down to the bottom floor, but it shows you how much you know, the anatomical concept and because it's easier to explain than the brain. And that's why you, there's tons of work for you. So, so you, you, you thought about the, the brain, which is incredibly important because that's what we hear with. Yeah. And I, I realized, wow, this is a whole area that it's sort of an unmet need in the field of audiology and something that, you know, audiologists don't even counsel their patients much about the brain. Sometimes I think it's, it's becoming more integrated into clinical practice in the last few years. Um, but that was a big motivator for me. Um, and at the same time, while I was taking my undergraduate coursework, uh, my grandmother started developing hearing loss. And uh, my grandmother had polycystic kidney disease, and she was on medication that was ototoxic uh -huh. and was losing hearing very rapidly each year. And her kidney doctor and her audiologist were not communicating with one another. And I was kind of learning about this whole link between ototoxic medication use and hearing loss as I was taking my coursework. And just over time, I watched my grandmother really uh, change, like withdraw socially, um, become more socially isolated, eventually start to show signs of cognitive decline. And I just thought, this is, this is what I want to study. I want to study this link between age-related hearing loss and cognitive decline. That's great. I mean, yeah, I think we all have some sort of experience, right? You know, 
as we're kind of sensory people, right? And so for us to be naive, to think that it all just stops at the sensory organ and that there's not some processing of the data, it's almost like, you know, in the computer, well, we're just keyboard people and we don't really care what happens once you hit the keystroke. But the reality is, is once you hit the key, then a whole bunch of things happen in the microprocessor that lead to some right. outcome that you really want, right? I mean, if you hit the keyboard and the letters didn't come up on the screen, you'd be like, wow, there's something wrong with the computer. Right. We wouldn't say, well, it's the keyboard. It's the yeah. whole problem. Right. And so that, that and it's a different mindset. So mm -hmm. um, you do that. And we, so that's two. You're a, a neuroscientist and an audiologist. That's right. And the so what's your one, third? Are you a linguist or what's the third? Cognitive area? science. Ah. So all tied. Um, yeah. And so as I started my PhD um, in um, speech and hearing science, I, I realized, well, I need to know, I need to understand more about the brain. I need to understand more about cognitive science in order to really look at this link between hearing loss and dementia. And so it was just sort of a natural thing that happened. Um, University of Colorado Boulder has a really cool triple PhD program where you can um, be working on all of this different coursework simultaneously. And I think it's great to get insight and input from outside of the field. Um, where, where it is the field, right? Because the real I, field is the cognitive effect of hearing loss, where if you compartmentalize it, you're not actually doing the work. True. Um, and so it was, it was just a perfect fit for me. That's great. So, you know, kind of getting down to it, like, you know, we all, you know, I mean, one of the things I tell patients is, um, you know, high blood pressure. If you look at the history of high blood pressure, you know, the medical field thought that we should treat high blood pressure in the forties and fifties. And we started treating it and we had the definitive study showing that you should treat high blood pressure in the mid 1970s. Mm -hmm. Right. So, finding these causal links and is, is actually pretty hard and it'll, it'll be faster for us, right? Because we'll probably have stronger data science and things like that. But that all being said, can you talk about maybe what the theories are of the mechanism? In other words, what is it that your grandmother had hearing loss and your grandmother had cognitive decline? And what are the thoughts in your field that the different, like how does one lead to the other? Yeah. So in science, we always talk about correlation does not mean causation. Right. And so this is an active area that is still being investigated. But one of the theories linking hearing loss to cognitive decline, I think the one that is most intuitive for a lot of people is social isolation. Um, so as we get hearing loss and our hearing gets worse, we may become a little bit more so socially withdrawn. And we know that social isolation is a risk factor for cognitive decline and dementia. And so that's one theory um, is this kind of social hypothesis. Yeah. I tell patients that they'll go from being in the conversation to the conversation occurring around them, but yep. there are others too, right? And so how about cognitive load? How about that concept? Yeah. So um, the other uh, link is this idea, the link uh, between hearing loss and cognitive decline is due to increased cognitive load. So the way I like to describe it is, um, let's say you have a gas, your, your brain is like a gas tank, right? Um, and it only has so much space that you can fill so much fuel. Well, if so much fuel, so much energy is being devoted just to listening and parsing that speech signal, the less fuel there is in that tank available for other things. So if in a conversation I have hearing loss, you and I are having a conversation. If so much of my mental energy is being devoted just to listening to you, what if you ask me what I had for dinner last night and I have to go into memory and retrieve that? There may not be enough space, enough reserve left for me to appropriately answer your question. And imagine living like that on empty gas tank all the time for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I say to patients, you know, it, 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 you know, because there are people in denial, right? They, they don't even think they have a hearing loss. And I always say to them, like, well, you know, regardless, your kids are at some point going to say, you know, you're not quite as sharp as you used to be. You're not answering the questions right. And, you know, the next step is unfortunately a care facility or somewhere where people don't. So even if you're not in cognitive decline, socially, people treat you mm -hmm. as if you're uh, in cognitive decline, which then just makes you more socially isolated. Right. And then the third one is, um, is uh, as if you think about our auditory system is housed in our temporal lobe right behind our ear. And that same area of the brain is involved in other functions like memory. 
Um, and so um, one other kind of possible link is, you know, as hearing loss gets worse, we know that the brain begins to atrophy um, in those areas of the brain. If the brain is not being stimulated as it normally would, it may begin to atrophy, may be repurposed by other senses like vision and touch. And so some of these structural and functional brain changes that arise from hearing loss is another potential um, causal link as well. So there are all these theories. So it's a big machine or a big bunch of theories. So, so where do you work in terms of all of this? I kind of look at all <laughs> at three areas. Okay. Um, but I started uh, my dissertation study. I was mainly looking at brain changes that happen in early stage mild to moderate hearing loss. And so what, how did you assess the brain? Just uh... Yeah. So I took two groups of people. I took a group of um, older adults that had totally normal hearing and a group of adults that had very early stage mild to moderate hearing loss. Some of the people in the hearing loss group, they didn't even know that they had hearing loss when they came into the study. Did any of them have low normal? Uh, better than normal, you mean? No, but between like, like between slight 25 dB, you know, at the bottom of, because normal is, I'm not sure, so normal. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you there. Yeah, so most of the people in the hearing loss group had kind of that sloping hearing loss. High, high frequency, frequency hearing disease. loss. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I took those two groups and then I um, acutely fit the hearing loss group with hearing aids. Um, and all the, they all received the same hearing aids. They were appropriately fit based on their hearing loss. And at baseline, acutely after I fit their hearing aids, I looked at, at differences in um, cognitive function between the two groups. I looked at differences in speech perception and noise um, between the two groups. I looked at the benefit they, that they got from lip reading cues between the two groups. And then we used high density EEG which is a neuroimaging technique. They basically wear this cap with about 128 electrodes and um, looked at how their brain responds to auditory, visual, and vibrotactile stimulation. So how they better integrate sensory input. Yep. And um, what we found is that at baseline, the hearing loss group, even though they had this very mild hearing loss, had poor um, cognitive function in you know, lots of different areas. Processing speed was slower. Overall, um, global cognitive function was poorer. Um, auditory working memory was also poorer. Um, and obviously had a harder time um, understanding speech and background noise. Um, didn't actually show that they were relying more on visual cues, which was kind of interesting. We thought maybe we'd already, we'd see signs of that in mild hearing loss, didn't see that. So you're saying and, the lip reading skills were not that different already. Yeah. Nope. Um, but we know it, that lip reading abilities in people with severe to profound hearing loss usually is, uh, they're relying a lot more on lips at that point. Yeah, I guess it's just, they're able to compensate with other mechanisms that that, that, that compensatory mechanism hasn't kicked in, I assume. Yep. And then um, pretty profound differences between the two groups in terms of uh, what their brain looked like in response to the sensory information. I mean, so I mean, that's density EEG. Yeah. So the biggest thing that we saw is that in a normal hearing group, when we present visual stimulation, we see activation in the back of the head in this visual area back here. But for the hearing loss group, they were actually showing activation in the back of the head and the occipital lobe responsible for processing vision and in the temporal lobe. So, you know, it's kind of that use it or lose it mentality. Right. If hearing part of the brain is not being stimulated normally, um, vision may, may encroach and kind of take over there. But, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you know, we see this all the time in like athletics, right? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a high performing athlete, you have a limp. You're just not going to perform as well, right? And that's right. a and if a normal person had a slight limp, people would be like, "Oh, well, it's not." A, it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish functionally. It's it's that's fast. Yeah, and the brain is it's adaptable. And you know, for the longest time, people thought, "Well, <clears throat> neuroplasticity is kind of at its height in infancy right. over those first three years of life." But in fact, we show pretty um, amazing changes in neuroplasticity into adulthood and older adulthood as well. So when they put the hearing aids on and then mm -hmm. they compare themselves with hearing aids to the normal hearing adults, what you see, because that's the question, yes. right? Like, in other words, 
We know that if you're hearing loss, your brain's not the same. But if we treat your hearing loss appropriately, here comes the punchline. This is what people want to know. What happens? Yeah. So we actually saw reverses in some of those changes in neuroplastic plasticity. So after six months of hearing aid use, instead of the hearing part of the brain lighting up in response to the visual stimuli, it went back to the back of the head, which is what we would expect. Um, saw pretty uh, remarkable improvements in cognitive function as well. So not all areas that we looked at cognitive function could we measure improvements, but in um, global cognitive function, we saw improvements, improvements in processing speed. Um, and in think some, faster, right? Yep. And working memory as well. So talk, I mean, just for the uh, non-neurocognitive neuroscience people, working memory, what's that concept for people? So, so they can kind of practically apply it. Yeah, think of working memory as a, sort of a form of short-term memory. Um, so if we're in active conversation, you ask me what, you know, what, what did you have for dinner last night? It's the ability to pull that information short term and recall that and then be able to respond right. appropriately. Not, not what did you have for dinner on Thanksgiving of 1987, right? It's, it's the stuff that's immediately available. Right? Yes. yes. So that, that capacity enlarges or the efficiency of accessing it improves or both. Um, so what, what we saw is both. Wow. That's great. And, um, you just become a better conversationalist if nothing else. Yeah. And I I think it, it ties back maybe into that, that idea of cognitive load. If we can free up some of that space, some of that fuel, um, so that they can devote to other tasks just by having a hearing aid and providing them with a little extra amplification. Um, and and intuitively though, I mean, the the first theory you touched on was social isolation, right? And mm-hmm. that's actually kind of hard to measure, like how isolated are you? But the reality is, is everybody knows if you have better working memory and better recollection, you're a better conversationalist. And if right. you're a better conversationalist, you're going to be better connected. Right? Yeah. And we did actually do some questionnaires as part of the study, um, kind of piloting some future projects where they filled out some checklists about social isolation. And we did see differences between the two groups at baseline. Um, and we did measure improvements in social isolation in the hearing loss group, but it was not quite um, statistically significant. Yeah, it's intuitive, right? Just because you couldn't measure it. I mean, like I'm yeah. saying, it, it, I just, I'm not sure how you could quantify people's social connection versus their social isolation. Perceptually, I get it, but you know, maybe yeah. the hearing aids would have some sort of technology to see how much people engage in conversation with them before and after or something that might be, I don't know, future work if you have yeah. that. Yeah, that would be, that's an interesting, that would be an interesting use of technology um, to get some data on that same question. So let me know when you have that done by next week. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's awesome. So that's really uh, pretty amazing. And so that was kind of your foundational work of where you're going. And so you're now out and uh, becoming a, you know, a faculty member. So what, where, where does that, most people continue on kind of the work that they did? And so what are you working on now? Yeah, so after I finished my PhD, I went and worked at Advanced Bionics for some time. It's a cochlear implant company out in California. And I was working on some similar projects um, related to my PhD work, but in the context of cochlear implants and also working on developing some new cochlear implant technology. Um, But I really miss teaching. I really miss interacting with students. And um, we had... Uh, my husband had a job opportunity back here in Colorado. So we ended up coming back and I'm born and raised in Colorado. So you're glad to be back in Colorado. And I returned to the university to kind of right where I started. That's great. Um, and um, it's, it's fun getting to work with the next generation of, of audiologists and um, talk about things like cognitive function and how we counsel patients about what we know about the link between hearing loss and cognitive decline um, and start um, pushing them to think about what kind of audiologists do they want to be? What are the unanswered questions that we have in the field um, that they could explore? So um, that's been a lot of fun. But um, research-wise, um, my interest now is looking at this social isolation piece. Ah, yeah. So that that's the hard one to measure, right? Yeah. And, and it's the one that um, when you talk to people, just everyday people on the street. It's the one that seems most intuitive to them. Right. Well, you can't have conversation. You can't interact, right? Like, you know, uh, the other thing you go from 
being the life of the party than not even wanting to go to the party, right? You yeah. know, and people don't realize what they'll say to me. Ah, I don't like socializing anymore anyway. Well, why is that, right? It, it, it's not because you maybe didn't intrinsically like it. It's because it's so much work. I mean, people are supposed to look forward to social affairs, not dread the fact that they're going to ask people to say what 37 times. Right. And I think the hardest thing about hearing loss, it's it's like that slow creep, right? It's like, it happens so slowly, one to two decibels, you know, a year. And it's by the time you, it catches up with you and you realize I'm having difficulty, you've already compensated. You've already changed your lifestyle, um, around your hearing loss without even really realizing it. Yeah. My book, I call it a death by a thousand paper cuts. Love it. Right. I mean, it's just you don't even realize it, but you're slowly being killed, you know, figuratively just being beaten down socially and losing that connection and stuff. And and I the other thing I always tell patients, which you know, people get, I said, the people who will tell you that your zipper is down are the people who will tell you you have hearing loss, right? Because you know, other people aren't going to tell you that, right? Even yeah. like, you know, decent friends, like you know, the way we get along with our friends is not what we tell them they do wrong. It's by kind of accepting what they do wrong and not saying anything, right? right. So only your closest uh, co- confidants are going to say to you like, hey, Mark, you know, you have some hearing loss. You really need to take care of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And one of the other things I'm really interested in is this whole idea of, of screening for adults. You know, um, you know, babies get their hearing screen. My son got his hearing screen before he left the hospital. Um but we don't have any kind of programs like that for adults. Um, we get a mammogram when we turn 50. Women get a mammogram when they turn 50. Why not get a hearing screening in your 50s? If we know about half of adults will start to show signs of hearing loss in their 50s. Well, I mean, uh, changing the mindset to it's a normal part of aging to it's a treatable part of aging, right? right. So, um, although it is a common pathology of aging, it doesn't mean it's something that's not a pathology or something that shouldn't be addressed. So. You know, you and I are very much aligned in that that fact, right? Um, yeah. You know, so, um, and it's a big problem to be tackled, but I think there's a lot of great energy and interest in people tackling it. Yeah, and I think audiologists um, and ENTs getting out of our uh, clinical capacity and and talking more just from a, a public health perspective about hearing loss, what we know about hearing loss and social isolation and dementia, um, and and educating the public. Because, um, like like you said, it's 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 attributed to being a normal part of aging. Right. Um, when um, maybe we should be looking at it in a bit different way. Being a bit yeah, I think the other struggle is is we have not been good at standardizing things, and so mm-hmm. until we can get our language and measurements <laughs> standardized, it's pretty hard to ask others to get on board with the concern of the pathology, and that's just kind of the nature of an evolving issue, right? In other words, get everybody aligned to be using the same language and saying the same, like, you know, as you and I are talking about, you know, there's pretty good evidence that lower parts of normal aren't normal, right? And so even the audiogram might not represent really measures of mild to moderate, whatever that means. I don't even know what a moderate hearing loss means. because I was just going to say, I think that the way that we screen hearing loss in adults is also a bit antiquated. Um, I love the audiogram, (laughs) but maybe we need to um, look at some different screening tools, like a speech and noise test, like the Quixen test is a test that a lot of audiologists will do clinically. It takes five minutes to do, and it gives a person a real world of idea of how they're functioning in background noise. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I was having a conversation about people representing audiologic data from a in, in information technology point of view, and they just thought, well, it's the audiogram. I was like, no, no. The audiogram is a graphical representation of data points. It's not actually the measurement, right? right. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's actually numbers across frequencies. And so mm-hmm. it's interesting, even that concept that people think that the audiogram is the representation of their hearing. No, it's a graphical representation of data points, right? Right. And, and if you think about even in pediatrics, a lot of my research in my PhD was looking more on the pia- pediatric side of things before, before I started looking at aging and we use a 15 dB cutoff right. for normal hearing for kids. Um, why don't we use that same cutoff for adults? That's something that I think needs to maybe be re-examined. Maybe we I need think to it becomes overwhelming from a public health point of view if you do. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly. So 
And so, you know, one of the other fascinating things, so, you know, I don't know if you looked at this or are looking at this, but, you know, one of the epidemics I think is out there is what I would call under treatment or of hearing loss, right? And so in your, I mean, essentially, you know, if you want to look at treatment as hearing loss is binary, either it's well-treated or not. So non-treated or under-treated could be considered the same bucket. I don't know if, did you look at partially treated hearing loss or anything of that nature? So we did a small study um, during my PhD where we took people kind of off, off of the street that had hearing loss that were wearing hearing aids, fit at a variety of different clinics. That's for and, sure. sure. Fit in a variety of ways. <laughs> yeah. And what we found is that um, for for adults, they were very underfit um, on average in most cases. And I think that's one of the reasons why we saw so such successful outcomes with my dissertation study. I personally fit every single um, adult with hearing loss myself, and we knew that they were fit appropriately, and we fit them appropriately right away at initial fitting and right. counseled them. It's going to sound different. Might sound a bit loud, going to take a couple of days to get used to. Oh, so you didn't even do gradual increases. You just got them to targets and let them ride it out. And that's an approach that clinically I um, learned from one of my my mentors when I was working on, when I was doing my fourth year externship in audiology. And I started employing, working with patients as well, because um, it's like, it's, it's like waking up the brain that hasn't heard in a long time. And if you the gradual increase is, is it works for some patients. Um, but we want to get them to that point where they're hearing their best as fast as possible. Well, especially frankly, for a study, you can only really begin the study once they've met targets or they're actually right. treated, treated. Other than that, it's just a ramping up period where you really can't necessarily measure the outcomes. Although it would be fascinating to even measure, like to show just another, I'm giving you a lot of work, but, um, measuring those, all of those variables as you're slowly increasing their, uh, hearing to meet targets, right? Like if you could say, here's your gap and we're going to go over four different, uh, 25% of the way over a two month period and then assess them every two months, it'd be fascinating to see what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, um, one of the things, you know, back to research, um, that I was talking about previously, um, looking, you know, we didn't see the hearing loss group relying more on those visual cues, those lip reading cues. And we didn't see a correlation between the reorganization that we were seeing in the brain and the, the reliance on visual cues. Until they were relying on them. Is that what you're saying? No. So there was no correlation between oh. reliance on visual cues and these brain changes that we see in response to visual Oh, so cues. even if they did or didn't use the reorganization of the occipital and temporal lobes occurred regardless of whether or not you could measure use of lip reading. Is that what I'm saying? getting? Yeah. So wow. it wasn't correlated with lip reading. What it was correlated with was degree of hearing loss. Makes sense. Right? So because it means again, you're not using that brain. So even regardless of how you're compensating, the brain reallocates that those resources, no matter what, because you stop using. Them. Yes. If the brain is deprived in any way, even a small way, even if hearing aids may not be fit perfectly, um, to target, um, there is still some deprivation present. So that's something that's kind of interesting as well is, um, this audibility piece is really important when we're treating hearing loss. It is the piece, right? Yeah. I mean, in other words, you know, um, you know, I tell people it's like blood pressure, right? If your blood pressure is 210 over 110 and you're being treated, but they measure it, it's 160 over 90. <laughs> you still have high blood pressure, right? So yeah. it, it is, do you have unrehabilitated hearing loss or not? Any, any uh, impact on the high tones? Cause as you know, that's a little bit harder to get, uh, from typical technology. Um, yeah, so it's difficult. Like when we fit the hearing loss group, um, they only had mild or moderate hearing loss. So most of the time we were able to reach yeah. those targets in the high frequencies, but really after about 4,000 Hertz, it's okay. yeah, it's harder. It's harder. Um, but, um, we looked at that correlation between a high frequency pure tone average, and we were able to see that. So, um, you know, that's where hearing loss starts in those high frequencies. So making sure there people are appropriately fit in those high frequencies is really important. Yeah, that, that, that's, that, that, this is great stuff. And so where do you see this going for you? Like, okay, so you're working on the, um, uh, social isolation part, like how, how what, what are those, those studies look like? I, 
for me, I'm excited to get outside of the laboratory. Um, working with the people, right? Working with people and thinking about things like social support groups for hearing loss. Um, things that a lot of audiologists, they try to have, you know, oral rehabilitation classes, maybe some classes where people with hearing loss get together and talk about their new technology and they give them some, some strategies that they can use. Um, but I think um, designing more effective community-based um, social support surrounding hearing loss is something that I want to work on. Yeah, so, no, I think that's fascinating. As I think about it, you know, it's, it's whether or not people are willing to embrace the stigma and join a group. Or is it rehabilitate their hearing loss and get them to reconnect with the groups they already were in? Yes, yes. I think it's I think it's a bit of both. I think that there's for people, especially with more severe hearing loss, yeah, it's hard. out that social support is really important. Um, you know, I met with a man last week that a friend of mine had said, Can you please speak with him? I think he's a cochlear implant candidate. He's not ready to get a cochlear implant yet. And just providing him with some support, like looking over his his um, recent hearing test with him and telling him, you know, it's time for you to to take this next step. You get evaluated, yeah. Yeah, I I think that there, for especially for more significant hearing loss, there's a big need for additional support. Yeah, you know, our, our philosophical approach obviously is one is, is the screening audiogram is not necessarily determinative, as you know, mm-hmm. but. We definitely, what we just strive to tell patients is how can, can you hear better? And then we'll try to figure it out, right? Because it's not, it's not, do I want a cochlear implant or don't I want a cochlear implant? It's, are there ways that you can hear better? Let's try to figure that out. Let's educate you. I mean, you know, it's kind of like who comes into my office and says, you know, I'm looking forward to getting a surgery, right? I mean, right. there's nobody who does that, right? Of course you don't want a surgery, but it's really, can you hear better? And are these things that you have to undergo worth it to get you to hear better? let us connect you with some people or somebody mm-hmm. who can tell you that it's, it's actually worth it and to overcome those fears. Uh, that's a huge thing. Yeah. And I've also been thinking and doing a lot of reading into um, other areas of medicine. They're um, using health navigators more and more commonly to kind of be that point person that helps people through the process, whether they're dealing with breast cancer or right. um, some other um, multiple things going on at the same time. And um, I love that idea of like a hearing health navigator, somebody that kind of helps a person, coaches the person through that process. Because yes. In our, yeah. in our center, we, we really uh, are very hesitant to implant anybody who can't bring a significant somebody else along mm-hmm. the whole process. And so they act as that proxy. Yeah. So it, it's really important. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. I mean, it's just, you know, because um, what we tell people is four years are better than two especially two of them that are broken, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, I think some sort of combination, like I do think these family members could be better coached. Mm -hmm. So if there was like a, a curriculum or some sort of, you know, what you should be doing at, and so that's actually a great thought. I have to think about that, but like what they should be given some sort of mini education as what you can do in this process, how you can help your hearing impaired person through this process. Yeah. And I mean, even my, uh, my father-in-law has hearing loss and I feel like every time uh, my husband's mom and uh, father-in-law come to visit, I'm, I'm end up doing some kind of almost mini marriage counseling sessions with them about, you know, teaching her, you know, if his back is turned toward you, you can't expect him to understand what you're saying. And so I, I like, I love that idea of tying in family members as well. And building knowledge together so that we can help the person with hearing loss. I mean, it takes a village um, it, to, for that to be su- that process to be successful. And I think that that's a that's a hole that's kind of lacking right now. Well, it's amazing the transformation of people's mindset if you just bring them into the not into the booth, into the room where you're doing the testing. Because yep. you know the normal workflow is you extract their loved one, put them in the booth, leave them out in the reception area do the test and then they join in a room for counseling. But if you actually show them like, look, when we read them, these words, they're not getting all of a sudden they're like, wow, this is really way worse than I thought it was. And that's important. Yeah. 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 So for me, I'm, I'm excited to, to get a little, get outside of the laboratory a bit and do some more kind of community-based projects that I could, I could collect research data through some of those projects. Um, But I'm ready to start doing, I think, 
for a lot of research, it, it takes so long to get to that point where it starts to get outside of academia. And being an audiologist, I have that clinician in me at heart that I'm like, I'm ready to start to start trying some new things. Yeah, I think, um, you know, again, more work for you, but um, measuring the uh, satisfaction of the uh, significant other um, mm -hmm. in terms of their cognitive, their social emotional benefit. I mean, it is profound to me. Oftentimes the spouse is more thankful than the patient, right? Because the spouse has been acting as their ears and, you know, people don't realize like when you have bad hearing impairment, like the spouse orders at the restaurant, right? Because they can't, the hearing impaired person can't interact. The spouse answers the phone, the spouse answers the door, the spouse does all, all of these things. And so, um, you know, measuring that, and I suspect not just their happiness, but maybe even their cognitive or, um, you know, their social connections too, right? Because if the hearing impaired person doesn't go to the movies, guess who else doesn't go to the movies? The hearing impaired person doesn't go to the cocktail party. Guess who else doesn't go? Sorry. I love that. I love that idea, Mark. And I was just thinking like we measured satisfaction in my dissertation study of the, of the patient, but right. not of the significant other. Right. Cause to yeah. me, that's the rise, right? I mean, when you really talk about, cause they're the ones who pull you aside and go, you, have, I mean, I, you know, I would love, I mean, it's, it's why I go to work every day. Um, you know, people will say you have saved our marriage. I mean, they mm -hmm. will really say that because like the, the one spouse is, is, is just beyond right and so and that that actually gets back to that whole health navigator because sometimes we have spouses who bull rush the hearing impaired spouse through the ci process because the spouse wants it so badly yeah um and so they'll push them through and that becomes a whole nother issue because we mm -hmm. want balance and we want the patient to be empowered to make their decisions so it's an interesting dynamic yeah and i, th I think for a lot of clinicians um a lot of that counseling piece yet you, you know in our, in our audiology program we have one course in graduate school on counseling um and i teach that course and it's not enough um you know and i think um from a professional standpoint we need to we need to think more about uh addressing that social emotional side of the patient a bit more and maybe having some better tools clinically that we can use different strategies that you've sounds like you've learned those things that work over time yeah but that we can teach new right clinicians out in the field well, that I, they can use. I think you have to bring it into your clinic, right? Like you are, I assume you have a teaching clinic at the school, right? So that's really has to be where kind of the, you know, the best practices start. And so yep. if you show that to your students, they model that behavior because it's going to be hard. You know, it's really on their clinical rotations. You want to see that, but it's not like you can, okay, all community audiologists that we rotate with will now have to, you're not, right. you, you know, as well as I do that that's not gonna, I mean, it's, it's not that they're bad people. It's just, they have a way to practice and you really can't mandate they practice. So it'll yeah. probably be a trickle up phenomenon. You'll teach the newer ones who will then raise the mm -hmm. bar for the already graduated. So that's mm -hmm. a fascinating, uh, fascinating stuff. So, so th this is a great, I can't, you know, um, so I don't know when, but at some point I'm going to have to revisit you to see uh, what, what, what you've done in terms of uh, all of this stuff. Cause uh, you know, this is definitely, uh, this is where my passion lies in terms of it, but I, it's not just because I'm passionate about it. I think this is really what people need to know about hearing loss. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, I agree with you. You know I mean? And so that, so, you know, as you know, I wrote a book, like people always ask me, who's it for patients or healthcare professionals? And I always go, yes. Right. Yes. And so oh. it's kind of like, <laughs> Who, who's your research for patients or healthcare professionals? And the answer is yes. Right. Because the, the awareness across the whole community, both healthcare providers and look, there's a lot of noise. Like there's a, you know, I mean, obviously the medical field has been consumed with COVID for the past two years, right? Well, that crowds out <laughs> getting mm -hmm. traction. You know, I mean, it's hard for me to call my primary care uh, associates and say, Hey, let's talk about hearing loss. They're like hearing loss. I've got people with COVID who I am yeah. trying to figure out whether or not they can come to my office you know, the hearing loss kind of hits down, but masks mm -hmm. have made people aware. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you there. So, so um, uh, you know, there are a couple of questions I always love to ask people. So let's say you're at a, um, uh, an awards lifetime achievement award you're getting. And so, you know, people ask you, who do you thank? Like, so who would be the people you would thank um, for helping you along the way, the mentors, the people who've got help you get to where you are? Yeah, I would say my family, number one. Um, I wouldn't be here today without my family. You know, my grandmother that I talked about at the beginning of, of the podcast, um, she was an immigrant to the United States, moved here when she was 13, didn't speak English, 
and um, she come worked from? Finland. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Um, and, you know, worked her butt off and passed that down to her children and then on to grandchildren as well. And so I really have to start by just thanking my family for where I am, um, the support that I've had from them. I wouldn't be there, be where I am today without them. Um, and second would be my PhD advisor, Dr. Anu Sharma. Um, she's amazing. I think the one thing that is different about her than some other academic researchers is she's a real visionary. She's really thinking long-term and really big picture. And she starts there when she's working on designing a study um, rather than starting really s- small and kind of iterative. Small incremental pieces, right? Yeah. And I, I, appreciate, I appreciated working under her so that I could start th- thinking in that same way. Um, and learning Did some how to, of the P100 um, patients here when she was at ASU. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, we just, they just started reopening the lab and starting to test um, patients again. So that's really exciting. Yeah. I don't know um, if she knows, but we were at one of the sites that were, that they came out and did them on. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I would, I would go ahead and, and thank her. And then um, one of my other colleagues at University of Colorado Boulder, Dr. Earhart, um, She's, she's also an amazing person and her and I, you know, we go on walks together and talk about teaching together and the future of audiology. And I just appreciate her, her friendship and her mentorship all along the course of my PhD. You record it and get transcripts? (laughs) No, but maybe I should. You write a book by the time you're done, if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. And so uh, the, the other question I always love to ask people is what's your favorite sound? I think it's a new sound. My new favorite sound is um, my baby's four months old. He just started cooing. That, that and sounds... there is nothing better than that. That, 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 that. Boy, you know, my children are older, but I know exactly what you're talking about. That, that, that baby coo and the new baby smell. Everybody yeah. Everybody loves that smell. So It's the best. Well, this has been great, Hannah. I mean, this has been wonderful stuff. I very much appreciate you coming onto the show. Um, you know, if people want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? If they want to talk to LinkedIn or how do they get a hold of you? Um, yeah, you can look me up on LinkedIn. Easy to find on LinkedIn. Um, you can also email me at Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H dot Glick, G-L-I-C-K at Colorado dot E-D-U. Well, there you go. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been great, great stuff. I really appreciate you uh, giving this the time and talking about a really important and fascinating subject in terms of how hearing and your brain are connected. Thanks so much. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.